Hello everyone, welcome to the All Indian Attestation class. This is part 3 of Overview of All Indian Attestation. In this part, we will be studying in detail about assessing the risk and developing a planned response to those assessed risks. This is part 3 of the overview of auditing and attestation standard. Please go through part 1 and part 2 because this is in continuation of that part 1 and part 2. Let's dive into assessing the risk and developing a planned audit response to those risks. Now we are jumping into actual audit. Let's say so far you have signed the audit engagement and now you are jumping into the actual audit engagement. What are things you will be doing in the actual audit engagement, right? That would be covered in chapter three and chapter four, right? First one is you will be doing the planning, right? For any audit or any attestation work or any review work, it's been mandatory to do the complete planning of that work, right? So how do you develop that overall engagement strategy? And how do you develop the overall detailed engagement audit plan? So first of all, you'll be doing a deep understanding, understanding the business, right? Understanding the industry, right? And then you'll be doing certain inquiry procedure with the management to understand more about their, uh, you can say, uh, previous year financial statement. You'll be reviewing the previous year financial statement. If it is altogether a new audit engagement, maybe like in US, like in India, it's been mandatory for all the company to do the audit, but in US for private company, it's not mandatory, right? That's a, that's a big difference between how uh, things work in India and how things work in US for the S corporation, C corporation, LLP, LLC, it's not mandatory to do the audit every year. So only in the request of investor, only for the lender or only for any special requirement, they, they go for auditing. Otherwise, it's not required for them to do the audit. They just do like compilation and sometimes just they maintain the account for the tax purpose. Right. But for the listed company, it has been mandatory. Right. Let's say any company who is previously a private limited company or never been audited by any auditor before. Right. And now this year they are going for a funding round and their investor need an audited financial statement, right? There might be a situation. So in that case of scenario, how we will be developing the overall audit plan, right? So first you'll be looking at their previous books, right? At least what is being available, their contracts, understanding with the management, or maybe like minutes of the meetings, right? Understanding the industry, understanding the market trend, understanding the sales, expenses, payroll, number of employees. So those are things you need to do before developing an overall strategy for them, right? This is the basic groundwork you need to do before developing the overall strategy. Once you understand the business, the next step is to identify the risk, right? Identifying the risk, are, there are two categories of risk. One is the business risk, second is the audit risk. Right? For a business, there might be thousand category of risk, right? But all the business risks are not the audit risk. So here is a difference. Like all the audit risks are surely a business risk, but all the business risks are not sure to be an audit risk. So as an auditor, being a CPA, for us, it's mandatory to identify what is impacting my financial statement. And if I am auditing the financial statement, and if I'm also auditing the internal control, what is impacting those internal control relating to the financial statement? Other than financial statement control, we are least for. So for example, there are so many operational controls in an organization, right? So we are not bothered about it, whether the like supply has been done on time or not, whether the production has been done on time or not, these all are operational control. So being a financial statement auditor, it's nothing to do with us, right? For that, they might have internal uh, audit team or they may have, might have operational audit team. They might have certain other quality review procedure. We are least bothered about this, right? Practically, most of the time, like newcomers get confused in between like operational controls and the financial control. So here it's a very thin line. Whatsoever is being impacting to your financial statement, whatsoever is impacting to your number, which is coming in financial statement are like financial statement related. But other than that, all our operation control, we should be least bothered about. 
No, we are we are bothered about those control which is relating to the financial statement, whether it's internal control or not. No, we don't touch operation control. Then that control will be then that is yes. So there might be ten. Controls in which two might be impacting financial aid would be internal operational control, right? For example, let's say it's a big production house. Let's say the Goodyear company, right? They are tire manufacturing company, right? First of all, they they bring like all the raw material, which include like numbers, chemicals, oil, lubricant, iron, steels, and everything, right? They put everything into the mixture. So there's a time attached to it. You need to mix for uh, let's say 20 minutes. Hmm? But the person who has mixed it only one minute, right? So that's an internal control for operation. They need to mix it twenty minute, but they have mixed it twenty one minute. It would be inefficiency from the operation, but it has nothing to do with my financial impact, right? Do uh, whatever the electricity bill will be extra, whatever the manpower cost would be extra, that would be actual coming in my financial sector. It has nothing to do with whether you have mixed it 20 minutes or 20 minutes. But internally, it, it may be inefficiency for them. So that internal controls team, internal audit team, operational audit team, they would be bothered about it. But as a financial statement auditor, it has nothing to do with us. Right? Makes sense? So most of the time, like auditor, especially like small size and mid size firm auditor, they get confused among like operational uh, controls and the financial statement control and they end up bringing a lot of inefficiency in the audit, which is not at all required. And especially in the big company like PwC, UI, KPMG, Deloitte, Grand Thornton, BTO, Bazaar, they all are big companies, they have very well structured and they properly and timely educate to their team member. But I have seen in big size and small size form, they end up testing like small, small pennies, they end up testing like small, small operational thing, which is not at all required for the audit, right? That's how you can bring more efficiency and economic in your audit, if you don't get into those operations, right? Make sense? Any doubt here? No, yeah. sir. So far. Okay, so now we'll be doing like overall engagement strategy. So in overall engagement strategy, what all things you'll be covering, right? First of all, the team member, right? The most important thing, who will be conducting the audit, right? How many staff you will be required? How many senior you will be required? How many managers you will be required? Senior manager required, partner required, quality review partner required, right? So IT expert required, tax expert required, actuarial required, right? So being an engagement leader, it's been our primary responsibility to understand the resourcing requirement and timely booking of those resources is also very much important, right? <laughs> I know, it's a pain point. <laughs> right? First thing is like the resourcing. Second thing is developing the detailed engagement audit plan, right? In the financial statement item, you have like assets, like, for example, your cash balance, your bank balance, your investment, your current assets, your inventory, your receivable, right? You have some non-current assets, your, your property plant and equipment in your assets, right? So what all audits procedure you will be performing? That is called detailed audit engagement plan, right? So what all audit procedure you will be performing in the respective section of the financial statement line item? Right? Same way for the income statement in sales, discounts, incentive, commission, in terms of expenditure, cost of goods sold, like payroll expenses, operation expenses, salary and administration expenses, like who will be doing what audit, right? allocation of resources, and then listing down the detailed audit plan for the respective section of the financial statement line item. Right? And then mapping that respective procedure to the respective resources. So who will be doing the execution and who will be reviewing it, right? And then the detailed audit plan also include the respective engagement team meetings. There are certain, as per PCOB, there are certain mandatory meetings which a listed company auditor are required to do, especially like planning meeting, 
and there are certain protocol and rules and regulation has been issued by the pcob in those meeting what are the engagement leader responsibility right so for example the engagement leader is being responsible to ensure the timely planning meeting right and what all things you will be discussing in that planning meeting it should be clearly laid down and timely communicated to all the team members then your quarterly review meeting your meeting with the management right your interim audit meeting your interim audit planning final audit planning final audit conclusion meeting so these are couple of mandatory meeting also need to be plan in engage audit engagement plan, right so that detailed plan is called audit engagement plan right so that comes in 3.1 after that we discuss about understanding of an entity and in its environment so its environment like high level we have covered in previous topic but here we will be going more in detail about internal factor and external factor for any entity for any entity there are two factors one is internal factor within the entity one is external factor that will be impacting the environment of that entity right so external factor may be change in technology change in rules change in reg regulation change in government right <laughs> that also impact sometimes right and then maybe change in import policies export policies right and uh, let's say this covid impact natural disaster right those all are comes under as an external factors which is not in the control of the entity internal factors what could be the internal factors labor strike yeah board of directors board of director change in board of director yes change in ceo change in cfo yeah adding new product line adding new service line more acquisition demerger merger acquisition demerger discontinuity of operation right those all are internal factors right that so being an auditor when you are doing planning so you need to understand both external factor as well as internal factor so that you can make a detailed audit strategy overall audit strategy and then detailed audit plan accordingly right next is understanding the entity control environment business process and including information technology system so first let's break this statement into three things one is control environment right control environment whether the company have audit committee right whether the company have board of director whether the audit committee is meeting on time whether the board of directors are meeting on time what exactly that audit committee is reviewing what exactly that those board of director are reviewing whether the company have ceo whether the company have cfo whether the company have cto if it is a technology company it's nowadays mandatory to have cdo right same way like uh, whether the company have you can say whistle blower policy whether the company have internal audit right those all things give you the high level overview of the control environment in an organization right that is something you need to understand when you are planning the overall audit right second is the business processes for example business process may include purchase and payment process sales and receivable process payroll process p2 uh, property plan and equipment process treasury process inventory management process warranty process or sales and incentive process depending on what all we can say uh, different thing that company operations involve right and it may be different for like the head office it may be different for the corporate office it may be different for different location so those all things you need to understand in detail right third is information system nowadays like no company no entity can grow big unless and until they have they are on tech so tech is now a mandatory one of the mandatory part of any organization even it's a small mid or large type of organization anyone and everyone who do the business they wants to grow their business right that's the reason they are into this right and nowadays if someone has to grow into the business they mandatorily have to have the tech base right so here it is important for an auditor standpoint of view to understand what technology they are using whether they are using like in house technologies 
whether they are using outsource technology whether they are on saas based whether they are using cloud computing services whether they are using database management services whether they are using sap whether they are using navigation whether they are using erp whether they are using quickbook right let's you all these are technologies so as an auditor we need to understand what technologies they are using especially for the accounting purpose it is something mandatory we need to understand right <laughs> being a cpa being an accountant it's being mandatory for us to understand anything and everything relating to accounting right so here uh, first we understand if you see like here the control environment which include here we'll be learning it general controls entity level control and the control environment so i think control environment we have discussed the high level controls at the overall entity level which is called entity level control like we discussed about whistle blower policy hotline policy uh, audit committee board of director management so on and so forth right that comes all under the entity level controls or you can say under the control environment umbrella second is it general control and it application controls so in it environment there are two type of control what is it one is it general control it is the general controls in the it environment so general controls which include like 2 plus 2 is given four or not in your system right or maybe like you have, you have given appropriate login id and password and only those authorized person are can log in into those respective system or not. so these are general control which is like overall it environment control then second is application control which is specific to those respective application so any one of you have worked on sap oracle or something or let's wait with book yeah so in sap anyone from online you guys have used sap or oracle navigation or any other erp tool hmm? are you guys with me sir uh, is tally can be an example sir not at all <laughs> i have worked a bit on sap and working on a bit of oracle now yeah yeah so if you see in sap or oracle or any erp or maybe like whether it's next suite or uh, quick book you will see like there are separate separate module for the payroll it's separate module inventory management it's separate module treasury it's a separate module p2p is separate module right these all are respective applications right so in which when you are processing like invoices for the purchases or for the payment that comes under the application so we'll be discussing in detail so here like in first one one and a half hour i'm just giving you like complete width and depth of the audit section which uh, you can see in next couple of months will be in detail <laughs> right so next thing here is the business processes i think this also we have discussed entity using service organization have you heard about this term before service organization yes right anyone would like to share what is service organization uh i can add to this if... yeah yeah go ahead uh so a uh, service organization basically in case if we need any assistance from organization in which you know we are, are trying to save our uh, resources to get benefit out of uh, like economic resources or manual resources just for the added advantage so that uh, they can any other organization can perform those things in a better better and quick manner and uh, with a cost effective mechanism so we use that also there is a uh, essays regarding in indian uh, framework as well that is sa402 which mm -hmm. comes under uh, for, as a audit of service organization as well so yeah. They, yeah. they help these uh, uh, user organization in a different manner mm -hmm. yeah that's uh, anyone this is outsourcing uh, is it is like it outsourcing uh, or no. go yeah, ahead sanjit uh, you can go ahead sanjit Okay, sir. So, sir, is it basically like outsourcing uh, our stuff on the basis of service? Like a uh, few companies and uh, give service. Uh, we give services as an EY. We give our services mm -hmm. or uh, like client rotation thing. So, yeah. So on that, so that accounting can be taken care of. Any kind of business process that company wants to outsource. Yeah. So, I think 
that's what service organization comes into picture yeah absolutely sandeep you want to add something uh, yes sir it's like a outsourcing of payroll service yeah yeah uh, or yes. any budget preparation mm -hmm. yeah that's very true like sir uh, all of you are like almost correctly pointed out so service organization is basically a third party organization who are specialized in providing certain services like for example payroll processing services there are many company who do payroll processing in india for the us company as well as within india also there are certain Uh, payroll processing company who have expertise in it like for example nowadays if you see digital marketing right uh, this is also a new domain which is emerging as a service organization like we also do outsource to the uh, digital marketing team and then uh, there, there there are certain company who do ap processing right so these all are service organization to which you will outsource your respective processes to the third party right here there are certain responsibility as a management and then there are certain accountability or responsibility as an cpa when you are performing the audit of an entity who is using service organization right so that also will be covering in detail uh, in which i i know some of you might have heard about soc1 report soc2 report right so we'll be covering in detail about those two reports as well third one is uh, fourth one is limitation of control and risk of management override so uh, i know like management put the controls to the overall organization but you know at a senior level they have authority to override so they have power to override certain control because like it head they have all the system controls. like administration of the it they have all the controls sometime like cto have all the controls ceo cfo have all the controls so being into that position is always be a risk of management overriding of control that if management intention is wrong or management is into any of the fraud triangle which will be discussing uh, in chapter 2 uh, which include like uh, opportunity which include rationalization and which include incentive right so for example like uh, if ceo promotion bonus or increment is based on certain sales or based on certain profit number then he or she may be uh, manipulate with the numbers and he or she would be in a position to add any pass on any journal entry to manipulate the overall operations or you can say financial shape so generally it's always be a risk of management overriding of control which we test in detail giving the all the fraud consideration right this all will be covering in 3.3 in detail right next one is 3.4 which is assessing the risk due to fraud there you go <laughs> so we got the fraud here so assessing the risk due to fraud including discussion among the engagement team about the risk of material misstatement due to fraud so here in this section we will be learning how as an auditor how as an cpa we need to give additional consideration for those area which would be more prone to the risk of material misstatement as well as fraud risk like i said if like for example sales incentive is being uh, or you can say ceo promotion increment bonus esops right generally like the leadership people get the esops based on the overall performance of the organization and they will get big amount of incentive bonus and commission on the overall operation of the entity that can be linked to the sales or that can be linked to the profit as well depending on the arrangement between the those charged with governance and the respective management right based on their appointment letter or agreement letter right so accordingly they will try to inflate the sales right if they are profit or if their incentive or if their bonus or commission is being linked with the sales right if their bonus commission increment is linked with the profit then there might be a position they will understate the expenditure they may overstate the sales and they may understate the expenditure so those all things those all risk you need to identify it at early stage and you need to plan additional audit procedure to mitigate those risks right so here we'll be learning that fraud triangle which rightly like we have said just before which include like incentive to the management to commit any fraud rationalization reason behind committing the 
fraud and the opportunity that means for example you have cash box but it is not law that means you will, you are giving third party opportunity to steal that cash right same way how much opportunity is in the overall internal control environment is being available to the management to the ceo cfo or the leadership position to commit those fraud that's called an opportunity so this fraud triangle will be discussing in detail the next one is discussion with the audit team regarding the fraud so like i said there are certain mandatory procedure both aicp and pcob has mandate for the cpa firm to do which include planning meeting right which include interim audit meeting which include conclusion meeting at least these three three meetings are being mandatory for all auditing right so here in all these three meetings it's being mandatory to have an agenda item to discuss the risk of fraud right so here as an audit leader as an engagement partner it's being my responsibility to make sure everyone in the team member understand the fraud risk understand the potential area of the fraud understand the audit procedure they need to perform understand the professional skepticism and professional judgment they need to carry when they are performing those procedures right make sense next one is inquiry with the management regarding fraud so this is also being a mandatory procedure both by aicp and pcob to do the inquiry of the fraud risk with the management right so here you will be doing the inquiry procedure with the management whether management is aware of any fraud or not right if they are aware of the fraud or any potential fraud what action they have taken right so those kind of inquiries are mandatory procedure for any audit engagement next one is assessing the fraud risk on other engagement which include like your attestation engagement review engagement examination engagement in all the engagement in which you are signing up any opinion or in which you are signing up any uh, uh, financial information it is being mandatory for you to perform the inquiry with the management and discuss internally within the team the potential fraud possible right makes sense next one is identifying and assessing the risk of material misstatement whether due to fraud error or plan for the procedure in response to those identified risk so here the two critical thing in the entire audit is one is risk of material misstatement and second is risk of fraud sometime in the same area you will see both the issues the risk of material misstatement as well as risk of fraud what exactly is the risk of material misstatement so risk of material misstatement is the what could go wrong and that wrong is being material to the financial state right so it can be on any assertion it can be on any financial statement line item it can be on the class of transaction it can be the books to accounts or it can be on the disclosure that is something you need to as an auditor as a cpa you need to identify and then accordingly you need to plan additional audit procedure to mitigate those risks so risk of material misstatement we'll be learning in chapter 2 in detail as well uh, they are like in in mathematical equation risk of material misstatement is equal to control risk plus inherent risk so we'll be learning in detail about the control risk and inherent risk also in today only that will combine together result into risk of material misstatement right so here you will be understanding the likelihood and the magnitude of the misstatement potential misstatement right then accordingly you will be planning additional audit procedure to mitigate those risks right next one is materiality so no audit has been done ever before and in future also would be done without having a materiality right so uh, anyone would like to share your understanding about materiality this is a basic concept i'm sure some of you might be knowing about it anyone yes kamal yeah go ahead 
so basically materiality is an amount which we decide uh, in the planning stage of the uh, audit uh, that what would be the tolerable error that would uh, that we can accept while uh, performing our audit procedures so yeah. basically tolerable error is certain percent percentage of materiality amount and uh, then we have uh, our testing threshold which are again certain percent of our tolerable error yeah yeah that's right anyone would like to add maybe khushi rachita vinith garima anyone would like to add to jatin garvit uh, materiality need not be in figures it can be a non financial event also uh, like uh, after the closing of financial year there may be incident in the factory like a fire broke out mm -hmm. or any due to natural calamity there may be a risk of closing the business mm -hmm. even after the financial date uh, that's a subsequent event again like uh, when we are talking about materiality we'll be talking about the numbers only sandeep here but uh, otherwise when we are performing the audit procedure relating to the risk of material misstatement or fraud risk area then we consider the qualitative factor as well but okay. when we are talking about materiality it's more about numbers okay sir right so there are yes yeah yeah absolutely yes yeah. yes absolutely true absolutely true. so uh, here like uh, just for the benefit of everyone what like question gurmeer has also shared very uh, nicely they defined about materiality so when we are looking at materiality you look at the user of the financial statement who are the end user is your financial statement is for private company or is it for the listed company is the general public at large would be using the financial statement or only the limited user so you need to look at from the user perspective first who are the end user of the financial statement which you are signing right and then giving it to number there are different threshold and different ways of identifying the material maybe for the startup company it would be different maybe you can consider operating cost or maybe you can consider the revenue as a base and maybe for already matured company you might be considering profit before tax as a base right or maybe any research and development company you might be using asset as a base or maybe equity as a base right so you can consider different base when we will be coming into uh, third chapter we'll be discussing in detail about all those criteria could be considered as a base for calculating the materiality but key point you need to keep in mind is the end user of the financial statement from those perspective what exactly is the material to the financial statement accordingly you can consider that as the base for calculating the materiality right so for calculation of materiality you can consider activity as a base you can consider asset as a base you can consider equity as a base right but then after when you calculate the overall materiality there are further materiality which you need to calculate to test the account level and transaction level that is called performance materiality or you can say tolerable error right so that we will be covering in detail in this chapter so, yeah so one is like overall materiality which is at financial statement level performance materiality and which like uh, you can say uh, you will give certain haircut to the overall materiality that means you know only in all audit there are some detection risks what is detection risk actually the possibility of the uh, wrong things can go wrong which is not in your sample because all audit you do the sample testing you do not do the 100% testing right so there is always be a detection risk 
That means the areas or the, you can say samples which you are not testing, there might be certain things go wrong. So you give certain haircut to the overall materiality being a conservative side and consider the performance materiality. For example, $1 million, you have calculated the overall material. Let's say if you are auditing a public company, generally we give 50% as a haircut. And for private company, we generally give 25% as a haircut. So if you are doing the audit of public company, then uh, $500,000 would be your performance materiality. You'll be considering that number whatsoever the audit procedure you'll be performing. And accordingly, all the misstatement, which is more than $500,000, will be considered those misstatements as a material mistake. Right? And accordingly, you will be framing your opinion. First, you'll be sharing those material misstatements with the management to correct it. If they do not correct it, then you'll be evaluating whether you need to consider that in your opinion or not. Whether it's being resulted into modification or adverse opinion, right? That's, that is a topic. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yes. Sorry. Haircut is 25. So, 75 is performance money. <laughs> I said other things. <laughs> right. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of detection risk. Because of the detection risk. Right? And then next one is using the work of others. So here, like initially, we were discussing about internal audit. We discuss about actuarial. We discuss about third-party expert. We discuss about you know, like engineers, right? So all the areas which are impacting to the financial statement, we may not be the expert in those areas, right? Special calculation which is required actually in work, right? like for example, leave and cash, right? Long-term employee benefit, maybe like sales and incentives sometimes, warranty claims, right? And for legal matters, you might be requiring attorneys, right and then uh, maybe for different category of tax matters you may have different tax expert you know like we under the cpa we understand the federal taxation but we do not understand like state tax or municipal corporation tax like any matter relating to sales tax you are not expert in that so those will be involving third party expertise right so how do you need to plan the work using the work of others. So there are two things. One is internal audit. The second is other experts, right? So for other experts, it can be management expert or you can utilize your own expert as well. For example, in your company, in your CPA firm, you have actuarial, you can involve them as well, right? If you have certified engineers, you can involve them as well, right? Or otherwise, you can use like management expert or management might be involving third party expert. That is also called management expert. So you can use their report as well. But you need to perform certain procedure to ensure the competency of those professionals, right? Integrity and competency of those. Yeah. I will be taking big at well. Right. Second thing is internal audit stuff, right? In internal audit, there are, uh, you can say, two types of internal auditor. One is like management employee that can be do internal audit, or they may hire third party to do the internal audit, right? As an external auditor, as an sister auditor or a group auditor, how we can use utilize the internal audit work. There are two ways to utilizing the internal audit work. One, you can involve them under the direct assistance model. That means you can give them low risk area to perform the audit procedure according to your standard requirement. And there it is mandatory for you to supervise the work performed by the internal team. Second is taking the benefit of the per work which is being already performed by the internal audit team. So there could be direct assistance model or there could be a reliance. 
right? Where we are putting reliance on the work performed by the internal audit, right? So, so we'll be learning in detail about like internal audit, management in the employees or the third party internal audit. We'll be understanding in detail about direct assistance model. We'll be understanding in detail about the reliance strategies, right? And for the other specialists, which is like actuarial or engineers or maybe like lawyers, for them, how to involve them and how to use them, right? So those all would be coming in 3.7. Last topic in third chapter would be specific area of audit engagement and risk. So here, an entities complies with law and regulation, including possible legal act, accounting estimate, related party and related party transaction. Those all covered in the specific engagement risk. Like we were discussing earlier so many times, if there is litigation involved, whether it's tax litigation, it may be litigation from employee, it may be litigation from customer, it may be litigation from vendor, like any kind of litigation which may impact the financial statement, right? Those all things you need to give special consideration if those litigations are material to the financial statement, right? Second is accounting estimates. So these are special audit consideration area. Now, if you see in the reporting also, it has been mandatory to report on the accounting estimates and judgments. Key accounting estimates, it's been mandatory to report in the audit opinions. Earlier it was not there, but in 2019, it has been is a mandatory audit opinion requirement to report on the critical audit maker, which comes as an critical accounting estimates and judgment, right? The lastly is the related party and the related party transaction. So these all we'll be covering in chapter three, right? So any doubts so far? So far, so good? Yes, sir. Yeah, Sandeep, join. Yes, sir. <laughs> Vineet, Ranchita, Pranjali, Kushi. Okay, very much. So, like it's 12, we'll be taking 30 minute break over here and uh, we'll be continuing at 12 30. Right? Okay, you all can join on same link at 12 30. And extremely sorry for the inconvenience because of the technology. And we'll see you back at 12 30. Wait, so.